I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Did we just hear that right? Did Jesus just call the woman in the gospel passage today a dog? We often encounter stories that make us pause and question. And the story of the Canaanite woman in Matthew is definitely one such narrative. Because of the uncomfortable themes of ethnicity, faith, and the nature of Jesus, it has challenged theologians and believers since it was written. So consider yourself in good company if you're struggling with it this morning. Before we delve in, as always, it's really good to get a little bit of context before we go in straight into what this means. So let's start. We hear that Jesus left Israel and traveled to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now, most biblical scholars agree that Jesus traveled here to get away for a bit, to relax, to go on vacation. Now, he actually makes, that makes sense. He had just fed 5,000 people. He had healed many up until this point, all of whom were Israelites, by the way. And so he had crossed the border and entered the territory that wasn't just a Gentile territory, but the land of the Israel's oldest enemies, the Canaanites. Ooh. Matthew deliberately uses the word Canaanite in his gospel in order to underline the outsider status of the woman who comes to Jesus begging him to heal her daughter. Not only is she a woman, heaven forbid, but she's a foreigner, she's unclean, and most importantly, she is the enemy. And in the midst of Jesus' well-deserved vacation, this despised woman won't stop bothering the disciples and then Jesus. How would you feel if your vacation was interrupted in such a way? So when the Canaanite woman approaches Jesus, pleading for her daughter's healing. Initially, she was met with silence, basically ignored. Later, Jesus speaks in a manner that seems, at least at face value, exclusionary. He alludes to the primary mission to the lost sheep of Israel, and then uses a metaphor that can come across as dismissive, even derogatory, when he refers to her and her people as dogs. The woman, however, undeterred, presents a poignant rebuttal, and her faith earns her the healing she seeks for her daughter. The passage doesn't sit comfortably with many, particularly when juxtaposed against our common understanding of Jesus' teachings. Love, acceptance, compassion. That's the Jesus we know. So now that we have a little bit more context, we see the issues and challenges that exist, the next step is to try, try, to make meaning of this passage. Now here's the tricky part. This is the part where we need to tread very lightly because no matter how we interpret this story, it's gonna come with consequences. And normally, those interpretations will only lead to more questions and uncertainty. So preview, if you're looking for a clear answer, you're not gonna get it today. For centuries. For this passage, the debate amongst theologians has been, is Jesus testing this woman's faith? Or is Jesus expressing prejudice? Both interpretations present theological implications. Both, both, uh, <clears throat> if, the interja- if the interaction was merely a test of faith, It seems uncharacteristically harsh, particularly given the, despite, given her desperate circumstances of the woman. Would a compassionate pastoral Jesus use this moment to test an already distraught woman in such a way? On the other hand, if we view Jesus as making a prejudiced remark, it suggests that Jesus, in his humanity, could be influenced 
and even changed. This interpretation is challenging because it seems to be in direct contrast with the belief in Jesus' perfection, that he is without sin, as articulated in the book of Hebrews. Let's tackle the first interpretation. It's commonly referred to as Jesus as tester, according to the commentators. If Jesus' intention was to test the woman's faith, one commentator says, it paints a picture of a savior keen on drawing out a profound declaration of trust from those who sought him. Basically, it may be analogous to a refining fire drawing out the purest essence of faith from the heart of a believer. But this interpretation is not without its pitfalls. It presents a Jesus who seems distant and even a little manipulative. Equally as baffling is the second interpretation. Commentators say Jesus is changeable. The idea that Jesus in his humanity could have biases and then be persuaded otherwise is both comforting and unsettling. Comforting because it makes Jesus relatable. If Jesus could be influenced by a woman from a traditionally rival group, it emphasizes the transformative power of genuine faith and dialogue. This would suggest that Christ, in his earthly journey, grew in understanding over the course of his life, that he was changed and influenced by those around him. That kind of sounds like mirroring our own spiritual journeys if we think about it. Again, this interpretation makes God, Jesus, relatable and comforting. However, there's a potential problem in here. Some argue that acknowledging Jesus' capacity to change, it weakens the divinity of Christ. Can Jesus be too human and still be considered our Savior? It's a difficult question, but one that needs to be asked. In my own humility, I'm going to offer just a slightly different perspective. That accepting the possibility of Jesus being influenced or even corrected by the Canaanite woman, I don't think it necessarily means it has to diminish Jesus' divinity. Instead, I want to lean into the fact that it makes him even more relatable, more human, and illustrates the profound power of genuine faith. Not his faith, but the faith found in the Canaanite woman. Consider this. Even if Jesus, in his divine wisdom, could be moved by the faith and tenacity of an outsider, someone he thought would never have influence over him, How much more should we be willing to listen and learn from those whom society might marginalize? It brings home the very essence of Jesus' teachings that every individual, regardless of difference, background, race, or status, every human being has intrinsic value in God's eyes. Last week, our group of young people completed the four-week book study with the theme of the existence of evil and why bad things happen. It's a pretty easy topic, don't you think? We tackled some really, really tough questions. Does God change? Is God influenced by our prayers and actions? Is everything that happens part of God's plan? Instead of dictating beliefs, they were empowered to engage with these questions and encourage them to explore different perspectives. The goal was not to determine a right or wrong belief, but to find a belief that helps make meaningful sense of this world. And then decide which beliefs resonated with them deeply, which beliefs guided their understanding of the divine, and which beliefs inspire them to act justly, kindly, and most importantly, compassionately. 
one of our youth participants shared a thought that has stuck with me this whole week. She said, she didn't say this, but in her budding faith, trying to figure out what she believes, she said, no matter what I believe, whether God changes or not, I want my belief to make me more hopeful and that it inspires me to be kinder, that it inspires me to change, to be the best version of who God made me to be. That's the God I choose to believe in, in her budding faith. You all have already figured this stuff out for yourself, so I'm, all, I'm only preaching it about a young person, not anyone in this room that has still has questions, I'm sure. Her statement was profound because I think it captures the heart of our message today. Our beliefs, particularly about God, should not only provide comfort, but also guide us toward becoming more compassionate and more understanding individuals, period. If our beliefs guide us toward harming someone or making someone feel belittled or, I don't know, cause violence, that's not the God I think we want to be believing in. Our God calls us, no matter what, to the compassionate, loving, kind, and just ways of this world. That was rift, that wasn't written down. I just wanted to make it clear. The story of Jesus and the Canaanite woman is less about pinpointing Jesus' flaws or perfection and it's more about the transformative power of faith. This woman, an outsider, displays unwavering faith in Jesus' power to heal. She's heard something. She knows. She persists, challenges, and advocates for her daughter's well-being. Her faith not only results in her daughter's healing, but also leaves an indelible mark on Jesus and the disciples whether he chose to or not. As we reflect on this story, I want us to ask these questions. How do our beliefs shape our actions? Are we open to hearing from those different from us? And most importantly, do our beliefs bring us closer to the compassionate, inclusive love that Jesus preached about. In the end, whether we see this passage as evidence of Jesus' humanity or a divine test of faith, the core message remains. Faith can inspire us. It can change hearts, and it can bridge divides. This morning, I want us to be inspired by the Canaanite's faith, the Canaanite woman's faith. Be inspired by her courage and the love of her child, and to strive to display that same tenacity in our own spiritual journeys. Was Jesus testing or, what, or did he change? I don't know. Shocker. But I do pray that we always be open to the lessons that come from unexpected places and that we'll always be open to the voices of those on the margins as well. Because if we do that, I promise that we, we will be changed and we'll be changed for the better. Amen.